Good morning, good evening, everyone across the world. And my name is Kang, and uh, Kao has been my close friend for uh, many uh, decades. So today I'm going to uh, share with you the most recent results achieved in my group in the most recent two years. So under the funding from uh, uh, DOEBES and GSSR, we are studying uh, how to reviving the very old, century old battery chemistry, which is zinc. And zinc, as you know, has a very glorious past. The very first battery actually was based on zinc. That was the Volta pile invented by Alessandro Volta back in 1799. It's a copper zinc battery. And the most uh, promising uh, electrode material, uh, lithium, was act actually produced by zinc, which was done by Thomas Brandy back in 1821. What he did is, uh, in his book, Many of Chemistry, published in 1821, he used water pile to electrolyze the molten state of the lithium uh, oxide, which produces lithium. So zinc has been you know, uh, closely associated with the early days of battery for a very long time. And after that, it actually dominates our life as an integral part, because zinc-based batteries, zinc carbon, has been most widely used by you know, uh, many uh, different applications, uh, small electronics, until the emergence of the lithium ion battery. But their rechargeable nature actually inevitably becomes an issue when the electronics becomes more popular in our life, especially when you, know, when you have to uh, discard the battery after a single use, as this has become uh, tremendous environmental issue back in 1980s or late 1980s. And that was actually the major driving force for Sony or Panasonic at that time to look for an alternative. So the alternative is that, of course, we all know that this battery was invented and quickly uh, took over. But even then, after that, this battery still does not completely eliminate the uh, footprint of zinc battery in our life because nowadays you can still buy from drug stores the, those uh, Duracell or uh, Energizer to power the uh, you know, most simple electronic devices you have. The major reason is that number one, cost, number two, safety. That does not require a special charging protocol. So since its commercialization of lithium and battery, uh, it's very successful. <clears throat> it actually dominated our our life since then, not, nowadays we are hooking on lithium, we are doing texting while walking, and in, besides the electronics and cell phones, lithium battery has also been used in uh, electronic, I mean, uh, electric vehicles and uh, large scale storage. However, because of this uh, huge footprint of lithium battery in our life, we can see nowadays from from now on, uh, time to time, uh, you know, uh, occasionally uh, the fire safety hazards in the uh, highly uh, high profile uh, news events. Starting from 2005, we have seen that the fire and explosion of lithium batteries under use caused a different uh, recalls and even fatalities. And for all these incidents, the non aqueous battery actually uh, has been, you know, play a major role of uh, being responsible. So based on this, I'm sorry, this slide is moving against my wheel. So this battery has been uh, so extensively used despite the, uh, the safety issue. However, we need to look for uh, the new emerging chemistries which can, you know, can be cheaper and can be safer. And one such issue is that, especially when it comes to this battery, batteries, the cost. We know that the key ingredients of lithium and battery, lithium, cobalt, nickel, those are very rare in the Earth's crust. Not only rare, they are unevenly distributed across the world. I don't know about the situation in Morocco, but I know that most of the uh, today's uh, lithium uh, carbonate were produced in this so-called uh, lithium triangle in South America. So in the future, if the uh, lithium and battery has to be used in every running vehicle on the streets across the world, we have to look for, you know, extra sources. And uh, the concerns are that maybe there are not enough lithium in the Earth's crust. So we need to <clears throat> look for alternative chemistry, which is, uh, you know, based on elements which are 
earth abundant, which are basically, uh, based of all on uh, aqueous in nature we, uh, because they are safe. And what we are doing right now is for to look for such a replacement, which is also multivalent. So that brings us the opportunity to revive the zinc chemistry. We know that zinc has very high abundance in Earth's crust. It's about 70 to 100 uh, ppm versus 20 ppm of lithium. This actually number uh, really scatters the, the Earth's abundance, depending on pretty much where, uh, you know, which source you are looking at. So we know that zinc is very evenly distributed across the world. It's not, uh, you know, uh, poor in uh, most of the region and enriching in certain region. Zinc is the most uh, uh, persisting problem is that um, uh, issue of challenge is that its potential versus lithium is high. So if we use zinc as a uh, anode material, advantage is that it's, it's tolerant against the water. The bad part is that it's not, a, not that, you know, uh, does not provide a very high voltage when you couple that with uh, a given cathode. However, because of its divinant nature, it's sort of compensated in part to sort of the, the uh, energy density, uh, especially when you, uh, when you look at the volumetric density. If we assume that 100% of the zinc metal can be used and reversible, the volumetric density of a zinc metal based battery actually is higher than lithium and higher than sodium. Of course, by weight, it's much lower. So I'm not saying that zinc batteries, you know, can be uh, used as a replacement for all the lithium or lithium ion or sodium, those are relatively mature chemistries. But I believe that in the future, there must be a small niche for this uh, application, especially for, for the situations where the volumetric density uh, is more important than the uh, gravimetric energy density, such as the, uh, uh, the small electronic devices, as well as the grid storage, uh, large scale storage. So this challenge that zinc meta anode is facing is very similar to lithium. Actually, it's the same challenge that all the meta anode faces, which is a dendrite. Because when you electrochemically crystallize such things from electrolyte, there's always uneven growth. And this uneven growth happens under electrochemical condition, as you can see that zinc growth dendrite has, you know, a very, a very similar way uh, to its lithium cousin. Even in the, you know, uh, un, not electrochemical uh, environment, such as electronic boards, zinc still grow such uh, thing like a zinc whisker. That's a major re reason that most of, you know, uh, short circuit uh, incidents for, for the electronic boards. So, to resolve this key issue, we have to study how the electrolyte and the interfaces uh, play a role in uh, suppressing or in promoting the zinc dendrite growth and how we can improve the uh, reversibility of zinc, zinc meta anode. So funded by uh, DOE GSSR and uh, about two years ago, we started to look at this issue uh, in a very comprehensive way we started this uh, system, uh, you know, from the very start, from the very beginning, fundamental parts, how the zinc salvation structure looks like, how it, it forms the solution structure at different concentration re regimes, and how does zinc transport in such aqueous and non-aqueous media, transference number and ionic conductivity. Especially, we pay close attention to the interfacial structure and both anode and cathode because we realize that the structure of the inner helmet snare actually plays a key role in either promoting or suppressing the charge transfer uh, at those interfaces. And the final question we need to answer is that, is there ACI? Because the traditional wisdom is that uh, the ACI uh, cannot be working for uh, multivalent cations. Most prominent, uh, prominent example is magnesium. Once you form ACI there, magnesium ion cannot pass through. And we want to study this case because we want to stabilize the anode surface and then we have to leverage the ACI. So as fundamental part of this, this work, we first uh, constructed the zinc TFSI and water uh, phase diagram. 
This work is based on our previous uh, missing TFSI concentr super concentrated water in salty electrolytes. And we realized that uh, by phase diagram, the zinc solubility is about five more uh, you know, approaching the ceilings. We cannot get any higher than that. And by mapping out this entire phase diagram, we can see that the zinc do has certain preference to form discrete compound. And those compound compositions actually predict what kind of salvation uh, uh, environment that zinc cation would prefer in the, in the aqueous media. So we did an extensive spectra uh, study. We found that in the uh, aqueous solution, even at the very high concentration of formal, which is close to the saturation limit of zinc salt, the zinc and the TFSI does not form very close uh, ion pair, which is very different from in the case of lithium. And that's kind of surprising to us. Because of this strong chromic field of zinc cation, the water hydrogen bond network is completely disrupted as revealed by the FTIR. You can see that almost there's no free water existing, even at the uh, uh, very low concentration and up to the high concentration, the water network is completely disrupted. And by doing exacts and modeling to support the uh, interpret interpretation for the data, we found that zinc strongly prefer a symmetric uh, solvation structure. So what does that mean? That means in the TFSI uh, solution, no matter what concentration you have, it's what most of the zinc solvation uh, environment is either completely TFSI, three of them, or six more of water, which is a sort of sort of like a octahedra uh, symmetry uh, environment. There's no mixture of those two. You don't have like a one TFSI and four water molecules. The exact reason we we still not not sure, but that seems to be very true and very you know, reproducible. So we have found this uh, actually uh, in the past uh, during the study of the uh, zinc salt, uh, its behavior in the water in salt electrolyte. For example, uh, at that time we found that zinc prefers six water molecule and in the, uh, in the water in salt electrolyte, if you add one more of zinc to TFSI, its salvation structure is completely kidnapped by the, by the, by the anion. So this, Give, uh, give us us a privilege to never reach this interface uh, chemistry because uh, very likely those TFSI would be promoted to be you know very easy to be to be reduced. Um, I apologize for this. My slide is moving against my will, as I said. We did the uh, science uh, experiment. We found that zinc TFSI and high concentration has this uh, strong tendency of forming this net percolating network because of the uh, just uh, I mentioned the uh, the preferential in the uh, symmetry solvation environment by zinc is the form either zinc TFSI or zinc water um, environment. So that sort of gives you the nano phase separation at a nanometer scale. The structure according uh, to this SAS here is about uh, 0.5 astron uh, reciprocal. That corresponds to the 1.3 nanometer scale, which is very similar to what we observed before in the water insulted electrolyte for, for lithium. However, if we introduce certain uh, inert uh, anion, uh, cations such as phosphorium, we can completely alter this structure and disrupt the, you know, even further the water uh, hydrogen bonding, I mean, water uh, zinc uh, network uh, in the nuclear structure. And that helps to promote the zinc transference number as well as zinc ionic conductivity. That's exactly what we found. And by studying conductivity, we found that zinc TFSI, although it's a divalent cation, it's almost as conductive as lithium uh, in the uh, water system. And what's more important is that it has a very high and low temperature conductivity. As I show here, and this end, you know, uh, and, and this, uh, 
this new temperature end of this 3D uh, uh, convectivity map, you can see that, the, that those temperature, the lithium salt already precipitated out, the salt out can no longer serve as a liquid electrolyte, but zinc can, that give us the opportunity of using this as a new temperature electrolyte. Electrochemical window-wise, at the low end, it was actually dominated by the zinc deposition and stripping, which I will talk about that later. On the positive side, we don't find any ACI forming. We don't find uh, any uh, other uh, process except the at a very high potential. You do have this oxygen uh, evolution from the water, but overall it provides us uh, a window of 2.4 volts, which is safe for us to you know accommodate most of the cancelled materials because the annual side is a limit was set by the by the zinc. And by studying uh, the interfacial structure or inner, inner helmocus structure before interface forms, we found that the addition of those phosphorium salts actually acts as a strong hydrophobic uh, structure former. And the interface surface, both anode and its cathode side, they serve as a key ingredient which you know, expels water from the uh, helmocus layer. And that helps us to, you know, suppress the hydrogen and oxygen uh, evolution reactions and give us uh, a better electrochemical stability window to work with. So to use zinc anode as a, you know, zinc meta as an anode, we have to study its uh, uh, reversibility. So about two years ago, we started to pay attention to this. We knew that this is a central old problem, century old problem since the day of Alexandro Volta, because the zinc has been known to be um, not very well to, to be cycling, in, in, especially in the aqueous system. When we look at the data in the literature, we found that most data are very promising, 99 or over 100% quantitative uh, deposition and stripping. But if you examine those data closely, you will see that most of those data are obtained. Those are true data, authentic data, but they were obtained under conditions which are not realistic for pra practical application. For example, the highest uh, economic efficiency number, 100%, we say in the literature actually was achieved by huge polarization in both negative side and positive side. In order to completely strip the zinc the, uh, deposit there, they polarized the anode, zinc metal anode, up to you know, nearly four, two volts. That's close to the you know discharge state uh, uh, potential of the uh, of the cathode. So clearly, you cannot do that in a real battery. So we feel that there must be, there should be a standard protocol which is close to the practical application, and no one has established that. And we should do this job. So long story short, we examine the different uh, critical factors, and we were inspired by the work. Uh, by the uh, paper published by Paul Albertus a few years ago for the for the lithium meta anode. By, by the way, I would say that most of the issues faced by the meta anodes are very similar. So we think that we have to consider such things, uh, such factors such as uh, area capacity, cumulative area capacity, you know, how much zinc you utilize, how much rate you can uh, you can drain from those, and uh, most importantly are those deposition dendrite free. So we, I'm sorry, my co-workers uh, Marshall and uh, Ning uh, help us you know, uh, to establish such a protocol. We published this uh, protocol uh, late, earlier this year. In this protocol, we use the uh, diameter of the circle to represent how much uh, area capacity per cycle you are achieving and we uh, sort of summarize all the literature, uh, most promising literature data in this figure. Those contour lines are very important, those, those lines here. They actually represent the, you know, how much capacity retention you have if you want to reach certain amount of cumulative capacity under each given economic efficiency. Of course, the most ideal case here is 100%, which gives you a straight line. It gives you infinite number of cycles, which can only be approached, but never, you know, never realized uh, in the real life. But for this uh, kind of application, we set a, 
a Go, which is similar to the uh, Go that our power upper to set for leasing meta electrode. We want to have two C rate and it's 80% of the uh, utilization and the cumulative area capacity should reach at least 10 amp hour per square centimeter. So from then on, we rigorously follow this standard protocol. So this protocol was published already and we use this protocol to examine a few promising uh, electrolytes already reported in the literature, not by our, uh, our group, but by other group. We found that most of the, quite a few of those promising electrolytes actually cannot even survive the first of few initial cycles. Because in the initial cycle, we standardize the surface condition of the zinc surface by preconditioning, building a reservoir on a, a zinc-free uh, anode cell. And we, we use this known reservoir, uh, you know, we know exactly the thickness and the, uh, how much capacity is there as the only source for zinc cycling. And by doing that, we have to make sure that all the electrolytes pass this rigorous test. And uh, unfortunately, the most of the promising, uh, so-called promising electrolytes cannot even pass a few cycles. So in developing our own uh, electrolytes, we rigorously follow that protocol we, we establish and suggest to the, uh, to the uh, entire com community. We found that by using one, uh, which I mentioned already, uh, one uh, phosphorium uh, spectator uh, cation, we can reach economic efficiency up to 99%. And that has, and the no current uh, density can support the uh, cycling, uh, reversible cycling of the cell up to uh, 6,000 hours, which is about 3,000 cycles. And reversibility, we found that it not only depends on the salvation sheet structure, but also very much on the interfacial structure. So on this 3D diagram I show here, uh, this star represents, represents our work. So far, this is, is the only known aqueous electrolyte for zinc, which can reach or survive the 2.5 milliamp per square centimeter, uh, along with 2.5 milliamp hour per square centimeter area capacity uh, go. But the cycle number, cy uh, cycling time is still not very high, about 300 hours in total. We want to increase this by at least 10 folds and we need to further uh, tailor the, the surface. So we found that interfacial chemistry actually plays a major role there on the zinc. Upon a recyc I mean, cycling of the uh, cell and uh, opening up the cell for post-mortem analysis, we found a very definite uh, proof that ACI formed. So this contrasts, you know, uh, con conflicts with the uh, traditional wisdom that zinc, uh, can, zinc cation cannot pass through the ACI. We found that this ACI has a rich content in uh, terms of fluorine, which has both zinc fluoride and carbon fluorine uh, species. Those can only come from one source, that's a TFSI uh, anion. And the <coughs> In order to promote this TFSI anion decomposition, the hydrogen evolution uh, reaction from water has to be suppressed significantly. So phosphorium ion plays a key role there in excluding water from those uh, those interface. So where are we right now for this work? And this, uh, that's our best uh, zinc anode material. We are still at this point uh, as, as shown in this, this, in this figure. But we are uh, getting, uh, uh, making a lot of progress. We are uh, fastly approaching this goal. Uh, uh, the economic efficiency is up above 99% is, uh, is within our reach. But to do that, we still cannot uh, use a very high, uh, high C rate of, uh, of charging, discharging. But it's very uh, encouraging. I mentioned it before that uh, from the first diagram, you can see that the zinc TFSI or a zinc OTF or uh, aqueous electrolyte can actually support cell uh, operation under very low temperature. So in this case, we uh, borrowed one cathode material, uh, which is hydrated uh, vanadium oxide. We found that uh, even at low temperature projects, minus 20 degrees C, you can see that is a DQDV uh, data uh, plotted from those cycling uh, 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 constant current uh, cycling are very close to each other, almost identical, you know, for our very long cycle numbers. 
So this is a universal for those uh, uh, highly concentrated or even no concentrated zinc, zinc aqueous electrolyte, because like I said, the water structure is completely broken by the uh, zinc cation, which is uh, working uh, to our uh, benefit. So very likely uh, this could be a very uh, good uh, low temperature uh, electrolyte, which can be even used to, you know, under temperatures of, you know, uh, Arctic environment. So we want to further manipulate the inner hemocost layer structure. We did this, uh, I just mentioned the zinc uh, anode before. On the cathode side, we found that it also plays a major role. I want to emphasize here that on the cathode side, we didn't find the interface, which you know refers to the uh, decomposition of the uh, the anion TFSI, which only happened uh, since uh, so far on the anode side. On the cathode side, we know that Actually, in 12 electrode surface, the inner Helmholtz layer dictates the charge transfer process. And in this special case, we found that we can even change the pathway of the cancelled chemistry uh, there. So one example we used here is uh, uh, the zinc salt, which has a very strong hydrophobic feature. We found that under, polar, uh, under positive polarization, the TFSI strongly assembles there and it expels water uh, from the uh, inner Helmholtz layer, which is very unique because in this case, when we apply this to the uh, air cathode chemistry, uh, that's a simple the, uh, carbon air cathode, we found the chemistry happening there is no longer the full electron process of the oxygen uh, reduction, but a very simple, very direct two electron process, which directly forms zinc peroxide. This has never been observed before in the aqueous system. We you know that in the lithium layer, you can do this because that's non-aqueous system. You only have two electrons available. But for aqueous, since water is presence is there, it strongly participates and promotes the formation of the, uh, you know, the, the, the four electron uh, uh, reduction of the oxygen. And this is, is not the case. We started this up by, by uh, DFT simulation, and uh, this work was recently uh, accepted by, by science. We think that this is a very new uh, two electron chemistry, which is very promising because uh, it does not involve water anymore. There's no pH change. It's extremely reversible. And the cell we can assemble you know, uh, into the pouch cell, uh, it gives us a 485 watt hour per kilogram. Then I can, you know, count, we count everything, the electrolytes anode uh, canceled and the uh, cell uh, packaging. We found that it's very reversible. We did an in situ XRD proves that it's only zinc peroxide which is forming. And uh, in doing this, uh, uh, and the anode side is still done, uh, not the most uh, uh, re uh, recent work uh, we, uh, that we achieved. However, for the canceled side, we can, Assemble the cell in a very easy way. We should hear in that paper uh, with, with a video, just a simple air cathode uh, material, you know, uh, porous carbon, pouring electrolyte. You can assemble the cell, which can work in the open air because uh, there's no pH change. Uh, as shown here, pH is almost a constant. So it's tolerated against the carbon dioxide in the, in the atom uh, 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 atmosphere. So it's not a zinc oxygen cell, it's a real zinc uh, air cell. So far we can achieve uh, up to you know, 800 uh, cycles and to say that's 16 hours. However, uh, with the better uh, zinc anode work, we, I mentioned uh, discussed uh, previous slides, uh, by incorporating those two together, we, we are uh, very, uh, uh, how to say, uh, we think this, this is very promising. So to wrap up my talk, this work was mainly uh, supported by uh, DOE BES, uh, GSACER, uh, and uh, I want to thank my co-workers, uh, Professor Wang and Professor Winter, and the most of zinc air sale was, was constructed in, uh, in meat using this uh, uh, concept. And thank you very much for your attention.